welcome to another episode of Jim's Along the Garden. Okay, now we're at the beginning of April. This is the uh, really your first opportunity to start putting in the uh, the brassicas. Now, out to the brassicas at, at this time of the year, most certainly if you're in if you're in Britain, really eat some um, kale and kohlrabi you can put in now. Don't be tempted to put any um, broccoli or cabbage or anything like unless it's winter cabbage. Don't be tempted to put anything in. It's a little bit early yet to put them in, so you know you're much better off putting them sort of mid-April to. Um, to early May really. But um, anyway, we can put the kale out, so what I'm going to do is um, put the uh, put the kale seeds in. All, all brassicas are pretty much the same. Um, they're all sort of little little black seeds like that. And these seeds have been very kindly sent to me by Richard Sidenham. Um He sent these over um, uh, a couple of months ago. So um, this is a couple of um, varieties here that he sent over. The first one's Scottish kale. Um, and he swears by this. He said uh, he really enjoys growing this, so I'm, I'm just going to... Now this is seed that Richard has actually saved himself, so uh, which is always very impressive. So I'm just going to um, sprinkle these in. Now I, I'm never overly particular with brassicas, but what you want to do is make sure that, that you know, the sort of seeds aren't sort of next to each other. Obviously when I was doing the tomatoes earlier, you know, I was, I was a lot more fussy with, with those, but what I like to do is make sure that the, the, the kind of an inch or so apart, um, you know, no no closer than that. If they are a little bit further, now I will be pricking these out and uh, into um, separate pots in a few weeks' time as soon as they're big enough. So I think I've got, I think I've got enough there. There's probably around, uh, there's probably around a hundred or so seeds in there now. So that's more than enough for what I need. Um, now what I have done is obviously I've put plenty of compost in here. When I was doing the tomatoes, obviously the, the, the compost was reasonably low. But what I've done here is, um, you know, I don't need to put glass over these. These will germinate as they are in the greenhouse. So I'm just making sure that they're not too close together. So that when I prick the plants out, you know, they're not sort of too entangled. entangled sorry. As long as the seeds are kind of an inch or so apart, um, you really won't have a problem. And don't you, you don't want them too close to the side of the seed tray. That's more than sufficient. Now all I'm going to do is just sprinkle some compost over the top of these. Um, I'm probably going to end up with around five millimetres of compost on there. You know with, with brassicas you don't need to be overly particular. Um, these, these, these will germinate quite nicely. Um, just make sure that they're all covered and they've all got around uh, around sort of five millimetres of compost on. Now what you do need to do, brassicas always like the ground to be nice and firm so with your, with your block of wood or your whatever, don't do it with your hand because you can't get equal pressure on. What you want to do is push them down reasonably hard like that and then give them give them um, plenty of water, I can just see one poking out there give them plenty of water um, to start them off. You don't need any glass over the top or anything like that, these will germinate quite nicely in a, in a sort of cooler greenhouse environment um, and then in these will grow reasonably quickly so I suspect in um, in a couple of couple of three weeks time these will be these will be most certainly up and almost ready to prick out most certainly within a month they'll be uh, able to be pricked out and sort of grown on so that's the um, those first ones with the Scottish kale so I'm just going to put a label in there and then bob them on the side over here the next one is um, Petrage's kale. I think that's how you pronounce it anyway. Now this is a this is a um, a variety that's that, that's quite big, and uh, Richard was saying he really really likes this um, variety. It's quite big. You need to allow 
when you when you're planting these out, you need to allow, you know, sort of two foot either side of the plant um, for these. So you know, you need to plant these reasonably far apart. So I don't want too many of these, but what I do want to do is um, I shall give a few away to my friends and that. I've got wet fingers now. So what I'm going to do is just spread them seeds out. It's never a good idea to have wet seeds when you're dealing with uh, wet fingers when you're dealing with seeds. Hang on two seconds. Just dry my hands. Right, okay. So these are a bit too close together. So I'm, I'm planting these a bit further apart for the only reason is I don't need quite so many of these because uh, the plants are quite big. And the good thing with kale, the one the the one thing I do like about kale is you know with a cabbage or or something like that. You know, it's it, it's it's kind of a one-hit thing. You know, you you know, you pick the cabbage or the cauliflower or whatever, um, and then that's that's it done. With kale, you can keep pulling at the leaves, and you can sort of, um, you know, you can sort of keep picking at the same plant, and the plant will just keep growing. And seemingly, with it, you know, with kale, the more you pick it, the more it grows. Um, so you know, it is it is a nice vegetable that that will sustain you for a number of months. And um, it's always nice to have um, on your on your dinners and that you know you know you can come to the garden you can pick yourself however many leaves you need you know you don't need to have a, an entire plant obviously um, so I've probably got about 70 60 70 seeds in there so I think that's going to be more than enough I'm going to put them ones back put them back over the tray so if I drop any they drop in there so I'll most certainly be saving the rest of these seeds for next year. So I'll put them away safe. Um, again, all I'm going to do is just put uh, around five millimetres, uh, or sort of I don't know, quarter of an inch or so, of um, soil on there. Again, use nice, um, you know, sort of fine compost. Again, it hasn't got to be um, seed compost as such. Um, I have grown brassicas in John Innings before, and I know a lot of people swear by that, but I find that's a little bit heavy for. Um, these types of seeds. Um, so what I like to do is use a more sort of peaky type compost. Um, I find it holds the moisture a bit better. Um, you don't need to water them quite as religiously. So I'm just firming that down in exactly the same way um, and you know I, I, I'm expecting a reasonably good um, germination rate on these. Again, give them a reasonable amount of water. These don't need any glass on or anything like that in the greenhouse, as I say. You know, these will these will germinate away quite well. Always remember, you know, if you're um, if you're planting your seeds as deep as we have, you need to put a reasonable amount of water in there so it soaks through the compost and hits the seed um, and keeps us sustained. Also, because we're not covering these with anything, there's going to be a reasonable amount of evaporation off the surface of the of the compost. So, you know, don't be frightened to give these two. You know, you, you know, a reasonable amount of water to get them going. So I'll put this over in the greenhouse. Um, the only thing we need to do really is keep them, keep them moist. Obviously not wet, wet. Uh, you know, just give them a little bit of water from now on. So I've just started them off, so I've given them a reasonable amount. You know, when I come back and give them a bit more water, I'll only be giving them, you know, just a quick sprinkle just to keep it, keep it moist. Don't overwater them. Obviously, you don't want to generate any uh, sort of algae or anything like that on 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 the top of the uh, the compost. And these will grow happily away in a on heated greenhouse. Okay, I just want to go through some of the comments and questions that have come over in the last uh, week or so. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Marina Wilson, she put a couple of comments. First one she said um, she grew calendulas last year, um, like I do every year, and um, she was saying those were attacked by sort of caterpillars and aphids. Um, <coughs> it is a shame, I mean, calendulas are sometimes grown as like a sacrificial plant if you like, so you know, anything like caterpillars and aphids and that will attack them rather than the, you know, your vegetables and stuff like that, but they are beautiful plants. Um, Marina, what I would say is do try and grow them again, you know, even though you've had, uh, you haven't had much success um, last year, um, you know, do, you know, do try to grow them again this year because they are beautiful plants and they do, um, you know, they do bring a lot of insects and that into the, you know, sort of beneficial insects and that into the, uh, the garden and um, I know the bees do like them as well. Um, the one that you can try if you do get caterpillars or aphids or anything like that is, um, you know, either spraying them with um, either soap or um, garlic. Um, like I showed last year, you know, just just crush up some garlic, put it in some hot water, 
give it a good shake and then uh, you know give it half an hour just to take in all the oils. Uh, you can put a bit of soap in there as well. Then just with a normal sprayer, spray that on and then that will kill all the caterpillars or rape it off. Um, you, you know it is really good for that. But um, do try again. And the other comment that Marina put in, and uh, this, this just goes to prove we are only limited by our own imagination or lack of it. Um, I've been talking about these, these bottle watering um, tops and um, you know I've been saying you know, it, you know if anybody knows where you can get them from and Marina's come up with the obvious answer just get the top off a bottle and drill some little holes in the top of it so what I will be doing is when I get five minutes I'll, I'll get a top bottle and drill some holes in it and do it. Marina yes you are dead right obviously you know what you can do is just take the top off the bottle drill some sort of I don't know one mil or two mil holes in the top um, and then you know you can make your own sort of watering device of that so yes you are absolutely dead right. Um, on the same subject um, Jackie Comber um, said if you go I think I think Jackie's from um, Canada uh, she said if you go on uh, the internet on um, on the site Geek uh, G W E K um, they've got them for sale on there um, at two um, at two and a half dollars um, and also uh, Dave Rourke hi Dave um, he said um, if you also go on um, King Seeds, um, there's a pack of four on there for £2.10. So, so I think they are available in various places, but they are a really ideal little, um, little um, you know, sort of um, gadget to have. Because, uh, you know, they're ideal for when you're doing the seeds at this time of year, when you're, you, you know, you're sort of watering your seeds and stuff like that, and you want to keep some fresh tap water in your greenhouse, it's an ideal solution. Uh, the next comment comes from... Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's Gary or Jerry um, Kelly, and he was talking about the, the birdhouse, and he was saying that um, on the RSPCA um, site, what it does advise is you don't put any dowel or any landing sort of perch on there, um, because what it can do is it can um, allow larger birds to come in and land and um, sort of get in there and um, sort of peck at the, uh, the eggs and that, and, or, or the young. So the RSPCA actually advise you don't put one on there. So what I'm going to do, to be honest with you, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it, it's just a bummer here in the greenhouse. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as it is for now. Um, if I do see any um, problems this year, what I'll do is I'll take, the, um, I'll, I'll take that front bit off and, uh, you know, to prevent any, um, any problems. But he was saying that, um, that basically the, uh, the, you know, the little birds, the tits and the sparrows and stuff like that, can actually land and get through the hole without any kind of sort of dowel sticking out or anything like that. So if you are going to make a birdhouse, birdhouse out of a birdhouse gourd, you don't necessarily need to put that on. So thank you for that tip, Gary. Uh, the next one comes from Nigel over in Wolverhampton, uh, Muddy Boots, and uh, this is this was regard to the um, the problem with the ivy, and he was saying if you um, cut off the uh, the roots and um, put the um, um, glyphosate um, or the or the uh, um, Ross 836 weed killer on. I wasn't aware that you could still get the Ross 836 um, weed killer anymore, but if you still can, uh, put that on. Another comment that came over as well, which was really useful, was um, cut off the root at the at the ground and drill some holes in, and then pour the uh, the weed killer in there. And that'll that'll make sure you know you get the get the roots. That's a really good tip as well. Uh, next one comes from uh, Mrs V um, Salsa, and um, uh, she said she's she's put some dahlias in already, and she's getting some um, stalks on there. But the stalks are quite hollow and weak. <coughs> what this could be is you put them in slightly too early. Obviously, you know when this when the shoots come through, it could be a couple of things. Either either it's not quite warm enough, and they're not sort of growing through as as strongly as you would like, um, or it, it could be that the tubers themselves are. Um, not quite as strong as they could be but don't worry just leave them to it keep them nice and warm keep them keep them uh, watered and I'm sure they will grow on you know I, I you know I shouldn't worry about it too much make sure um, that they are frost free uh, you know keep them you, you know keep them most certainly as warm as you can um, don't let the frost get to them and then you know they should grow on and um, you know produce some nice daily flowers for you later in the year but that's the best advice don't worry too much just make sure they're kept watered and they're kept warm and uh, you know they should be okay. Don't worry if they're a little bit too weak at this time of year. It is still early for Davies, to be honest with you. Um, you know the fact that you've got stems on there. You know you know they're doing quite well. Next comment comes from Scott Parker, and he was saying about um, 
tomatoes. He, he, he's over in Derby in the UK and he was saying um, is it the right kind of time to um, plant your tomatoes out? Um, he's got a cold greenhouse he said or oh, should I wait? Um, I don't know if the clip's in this video or not but I've literally just put my tomatoes in. Um, to be honest with you this year we're you know we're enjoying quite good weather. I don't predict it's going to go sort of too bad if it does at all. Um, so what I would suggest is do put your tomatoes in Put them under glass like I've shown you, I've, I don't know if this clips in this one or not, but what I've got is I've got them in a tray with a piece of glass on top, just put the, put the label there to give it a little bit of ventilation and then try to keep them as close to the centre of the greenhouse as you can, so if there is a frost, you know, the, the outsides are going to get cooler first um, and then they should be protected enough to, um, to, uh, you know, to grow on. If you look on the majority of tomato seed packets, it says you can plant them right from kind of January, some of them, all the way up to April. So um, I think you'd be more than, you know, more than okay to plant them now. Um, if the weather does turn really bad, I don't expect it will do, but if it does, you can always, um, you, you can always take them inside, um, you know, if, it, you know, if the weather is uh, predicted to get too bad. The other trick you can do is... Um, obviously keep the wind as, as close as possible in the greenhouse, you don't need to, you know, you, you want some ventilation but you don't need to sort of get too cool. What you can do is do the candle trick where you get um, a pitcher pot um, and put a um, candle in there, um, you know, just a, just a, um, just two or three um, of the, uh, the night light ones, you know, the short candles. Uh, put a couple of those in there, light them in the greenhouse in the middle and then put a pitcher pot on top of that and what you will find is the pitcher pots heat up during the um, during the time the candles on. Obviously, the candle will burn out, but there's sufficient heat um, stored in the uh, the pitcher pot, which is like a clay pot, um, to keep the greenhouse frost free for the uh, you know for the evening. So if you do get a frost, you can always do that, or you can just take your tomato plants in the house for you know a couple of days if it does get bad. But in all honesty, from what I've seen of the weather so far. I think we're in for a good year this year. I think you know. I don't think we're going to get much of a frost if we do at all. It's most certainly not going to get sort of you know sort of minus five, six, seven, eight. You know, I think you know we might get a minus one, minus two, but there should be enough thermal mass inside your greenhouse really to keep it um, you know sort of keep it warm. So keep the tomato plants as as close to the middle of the greenhouse as you can, and as uh, as elevated as you can. Obviously, the uh, hot air rises so. And you know, so the middle part, as high as you can get it in the greenhouse, is going to stay the warmest for the longest. So uh, that's the best bit of advice I can give you. But by all means, put your tomato plants in now and get them started off. Um, next comment comes from uh, Muddy Boots, and also Allotment Bubble came up with exactly the same thing. And yes, you are right. Um, again, this comes back to we're only limited by our own imagination. When I made the tunnel, I made the catch um, on the outside of the door. And when I was making it, I was thinking, right, if I get locked inside the um, the um, tunnel, I can always push the bolt with my finger through. And if you remember when I, when I was doing the videos, I was saying what you can do is you can make like a um, a notch in the pipe so that the that the, um, the the sort of the hoop of metal that is the catch would would drop down and lock. The reason I didn't do that, I didn't explain it in the video, but the reason I didn't do that is I thought, well. If I do get caught inside and the door's shut for whatever reason and locked, what I can always do is, is push the bolt through with my finger from the inside and get out. Um, what I didn't think of was if I was inside the um, tunnel, how could I stop the door from shut uh, from opening? So what I should have done by rights was um, put a um, another um, sort of loop on the inside, if you like, in another slot, so I can I could open and shut the the bolt from the inside as well. I didn't think about that to be honest with you at the time and uh, obviously if I did it again I would I would do that. Now that the the bolt's in there I'm going to struggle to drill another slot in the other side so what I'm thinking of doing is, is putting another piece of metal um, on top of the one on the outside onto the inside so I can I can actuate it if you like from the inside as well. So. Um, the jury's out on this one at the moment, but I will do something so I can lock it from the inside. Nigel, you are, and Allotment Bubble, you are exactly right. I should have thought of that, and I didn't, so um, apologies. Obviously, if I do it again, I'll always, I'll always do that again. But um, but yeah, I'm going to come up with something. I think what I'll do is, where the 
where the round bit is, what I'm going to do is, is just make it like a, a piece of metal that goes up and then across and then make another slot in the aluminium plate that I'm going to put on the front so I can, I can slide it from the inside as well. Uh, next comment comes from Pauline uh, McDowell and um, she was saying how much trouble was it to move the frame from the garden into the allotment. As you saw in the video, it took, um, it took it, um, after I got the nuts and bolts out and all the rest of it, it took about four minutes to take the whole thing down in the allotment. Um, it took about uh, ten minutes to carry it from the garden to the allotment and then to put it back up took about five minutes um, and then I put the, the bolts in that. So all told, I moved it from the garden to the allotment in around 40 minutes or so, so it wasn't really too bad to be honest with you. Um, I had made the parts um, sort of small enough to manage, um, you know, as I was building it that was one of the, the, you know, the things I was thinking about, making it small enough so I could dismantle it and bring it into the allotment and move it about if I needed to, so, so yeah, it wasn't too bad, about 40 minutes it took. Um, next one comes from Scientific Explorer Girl and uh, she was saying uh, the cost of gardening supplies in the UK compared to Canada. Um, it, it's quite possibly the fact that it, it, in the UK, I think we are a nation of gardeners. I think you know it is quite a popular pastime in the UK, and uh, you know the UK is described as God's garden, if you like, you know, because it, it stuff does grow really well over here. Even though we get sort of unpredictable weather as such, we do get quite a lot of rain. Um, and we get quite a lot of sun. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. So it, it, it is a. Um, I know we always, as British people, we always moan about the weather, but uh, we are quite lucky. I mean, I've spent time in other countries, and uh, we don't realise how lucky we are uh, with the weather that we've got. How much you know? How much stuff we can actually grow. Um, so yeah, um, I think it is. Um, I think gardening's a lot more. Um, common in the UK and I think that's possibly why there's more garden centres and there's more people selling online and that which brings the prices down. Um, what she was actually um, talking about was the um, was the mesh that I'd used for the tunnel in, um, in particular. Now I did actually buy that over the internet um, so if you do want to get it in Canada I'm sure you would be able to order it uh, it, it actually came from eBay, from a company advertised on eBay. And if you put scaffolding, uh, um, debris net, um, that green stuff comes up. And you can buy it over the internet and they will post it to you. Um, I don't know what the postage is like. Um, I know importing stuff from America is quite expensive. I'm not quite sure how it is for Canada. But um, but yeah, you know, it, it is reasonably cheap in the UK, I know that. Um, but uh, but yeah, good comment. Thank you very much. Next one is another comment from um, Allotment Bubble. Thank you for your comments again. Um, and um, there's two comments. The first one was, um, would it have been an idea to bolt aluminium into the framework instead of um, steel to, to to keep down the weight? Yes, it would have been. But there was there was two reasons why I made it all out of steel. Um, the first one is I, I needed a reasonable amount of weight in there. Um, to keep it down because I get quite a lot of wind through here, so I wanted the 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 um, I wanted the the tunnel to weigh a reasonable amount so that the wind wouldn't pull it over and, and break it and stuff. Um, so yeah, you know, aluminium would have made it lighter, but the problem that you get uh, with um, with stuff like that is if you've got steel and aluminium and you bolt them together, uh, what you get is a um, an electrical charge between the two metals. Um, and they're because the metals are different, they've got different properties. And what you get is one of the two metals will sacrifice itself. Um, and this is this is a well-known science, which is why on steel um, on steel boats they'll always bolt a, a, a big piece of zinc underneath the boat. Um, and basically, the, it's it, it's like a sacrificial metal, if you like. So that that will stop the the iron um, or the steel. Um, rusting on the boat, or it'll, it, it, it will at least reduce it. Uh, the zinc will, will will corrode away instead in the, in the salt water. Um, in exactly the same way, if you ever get a, an aluminium greenhouse, you'll always note that the nuts and bolts that you use to put it together are also aluminium, because if you put steel on there, you know it, it causes problems. So, mixing aluminium and steel together can cause problems because um, of this because of this physical property. But uh, but yeah, 
sorry, science aside, yes you are right, using aluminium would have made it lighter, but I wanted to keep it as, as light, as, as, as heavy as possible. Okay, and the second comment from um, Allotment Bubble was all about asparagus, and um, you were asking, uh, when the asparagus is growing, how many um, spears do you get off each of the um, asparagus plants? I would say off, off, off each of the roots that you get in the, uh, the ground, I get probably five or six um, coming through. So what I'll always do um, is um, I'll, I'll harvest about um, sort of four or five um, spears off the, off the plant and I'll always try to leave um, you know, one on there. Now when they come through, they come through like sort of like about the size of your finger and as soon as they get to kind of sort of six, seven inches high, that's the right time to cut them off and, and sort of eat them. After you've cropped, um, I would say five or six off each of the plants, then leave the plants, then the plant will grow some more. Um, obviously the more you cut at it, the, you know, the more that will grow. So what I typically do is, is harvest about four or five off each of the plants, and then, um, and then I just leave it to grow, and then I typically get about another four or five on each of the plants growing through. I don't harvest any more than that um, because it does weaken the plants obviously um, you know if you cut too many off but um, as a rule I've got about um, I've got about uh, probably about 15 16 plants up here and I typically get about four or five spears off each of the plants and then I'll just leave it to grow after that so you know you know to give you an idea that's the, you know that's how much but you do need to let the plants establish themselves if you've only just planted your asparagus what I suggest you do the first year you put it in let them just let them grow don't harvest anything off them at all and then the second year only harvest maybe two or three spears off each of the plants and then after they've got themselves really established then you can start to you know sort of take more off but uh, but yeah um, last year was the first year i really cropped heavily off my asparagus um the year before i had just two or three um and then the year before that i didn't harvest any at all so um so yeah you should get about four or five off each plant. So if the plant's really established, obviously you may be able, you, you know, you, you know, you may all be able to take more and more off it. But uh, I would say, you know, limit yourself um, to sort of four or five. I would say to keep the plant nice and healthy. And the last um, last comment comes from um, Al's allotment, um, talking about dailies in pots and that. Yes, I always grow the uh, the dailies in a pot. I find that um, it gives them a really good start. So when the the, the frosts have gone. You know, you can put them out into the garden. They will grow much quicker then because they've already established themselves. Um, I find that the compost you put around them gives them a good start as well. So there's plenty of nutrition in there because they are reasonably hungry plants. And then you get uh, with with dailies, you find that um, you know you get a much longer season with them if you start them off in a pot, get them growing nice and healthily, and then plant them out. Plant them a bit deeper than you got them in the pot, about sort of two inches or so plant them a bit deeper when you put them outside and then as long as you keep pulling the, 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 the you know, dead head in and if it's been raining pull off the buds if they're, they're damaged by the rain you'll find that you get a lot more flowers and the plants a lot more healthier if you, um, if you do that so yeah I've always grown dahlias um, in a pot start them off in a pot um, the other trick as well is if you do grow them in a pot what you can do is before you put them out you can also take cuttings off what's grown in the pot so as soon as they get to I don't know about sort of, um, sort of six or seven inches high what you can do is take a cutting off there and you can grow them on as a cutting um, and then they'll form their own sort of bulbs underneath if you like um, you know as the year goes on so you can that's another way of multiplying your um, your dahlias you can either split the split them as you know we were talking before put the forks in or a spade chop it or whatever um, or you can take cuttings, grow the cuttings, and then um, you know you can you can grow them on um, you know during that year and put them out for the following year. So I hope this episode of Jim's Lama Garden has been some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions that you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Lama Garden.